It's been almost two years ago, um, and I had a fellow come to me who wanted a, you know, I'm primarily a rocking chair maker, and he wanted a rocking chair, and he wanted it out of walnut, which is fine. That's what I do a lot. Uh, so I started putting together the order, and then he said, I want it black. I said, I thought you wanted walnut. He said, yeah, I want it black. I said, well, fine, I'll give you a wood that's good, strong, and sturdy, and we'll make it black. And he said, no, you don't understand. I want walnut. I want it black. And as I cried a little bit, going, what am I going to do with this walnut? <laughs> I went out and got the walnut. I built the chair, and we made it black. So I had to find out how to ebonize, how to turn it what I thought was black. I turned back to what I said. I used to be an engineer, and I had what was called a... a uh, problem-solving matrix. I'm going, to, I'm going to share it with you because we're going to work through that today. First thing you do is you define the problem. The problem was is I had wood that needed to be ebonized. Okay? Secondly, what you do is you research the possible solutions. What can you, how can you solve the problem? Then you pick some solutions. Then finally, you test the solutions. And then finally, the fifth one is you pick the solution. And that's what we're going to do here. I, I went through, I've got three solutions, and I want to kind of walk through them this way. And if you have a problem, approach it that way, and it really helps. Einstein said that he never solved a problem. He just defined a whole bunch of them. And I think that's what it really amounts up to, because as you define the problem, you'll find out that you, in effect, are solving it. Okay? So, oops, sorry. Sorry, excuse me. Um, the first thing I wanted to say was, go back to my page here, what is ebonizing? Everybody's got a whole different idea, I found out. To me, ebonizing is just making it black. If you, I have a quote in here, if you talk to a, a museum uh, per type person, they want it kind of reddish brown. Another uh, idea of ebonizing is a chemical reaction that turns it anywhere from charcoal to black. So, what is ebonizing? I started looking it up. I went to the source of all knowledge of the uh, excuse me, of all knowledge of the universe. Yeah, the Google. <laughs> and you start googling things and you start finding out what people think are ebony. First of all, what is ebony? That's the first thing I wanted to ask myself. What is ebony? Ebony is wood, yeah. But ebony is technically from the phylum family of diasporus. No big deal, but it'll say diasporus something. Okay. And then they change the definition and say, if it's black. Okay. Texas black wood or Texas ebony is not truly a diasporus wood. It's not really an ebony, but it is an ebony. Winge is not technically an ebony, but it's a dark wood and it's considered ebony. Ebony today, if you get it from Africa, you are probably getting ready to do 20 years in jail because nothing coming out of Africa is legal. Nothing. No ebony coming out of Africa is legal. So if they say it came out of Africa, they're either lying to you or you're going to get ready to be in trouble. Okay? It's all being, products are being made in Africa. But it comes from other places, Sri Lanka, Jamaica, uh, southern Texas, I guess, for their, for their type. Uh, Ceylon, anywhere along the tropics. And generally speaking, ebony is a dark or black wood that when placed in water, sinks. Okay? That's the big one. It's got to be heavy enough that it sinks. And the third characteristic is, is that when you turn it or polish it, it's extremely close grained and it will polish like plastic almost exactly like when you ebonize something like maple, okay? Think of a, uh, a clarinet. A clarinet is, 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 is usually made, used to be made out of ebony, okay? So after I determined what was ebony, makes it a little easier. I can go from a red-brown to a black. I prefer solid black, and that's my goal today is solid black, okay? So I wanted to clear it up just so that we know, because some people, like I said, will tell you that is not ebonizing wood. Okay? All right. Change my pages here. So I picked three solutions. Three solutions. I went out, and, and after I did that, that uh, 
I checked a couple of years ago, I determined that the most common one that comes up is iron acetate, vinegar and steel. Have you ever heard of that? You take vinegar together and steel. How many have actually tried it? How many have actually got a cold black finish from it? Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you how to do that. That's the first thing I'm going to tell you. And uh, then I'm going to tell you two other ways that are quicker. All right? So we'll start with that one. First thing you do, get yourself a plastic bottle. Plastic, underlined, bold, colored, plastic, not glass. Why? You take this in a glass bottle and you drop it, it stains everything. Take plastic. Trust me, okay? The second thing you do is you drill little holes in the top. One eighth inch holes, two or three. Okay, you put it up and you grab yourself some steel wool and tear it apart in a couple of pieces and you just stuff it in there. Okay, now I'm OCD. Matter of fact, I'm so OCD that I'm really CDO. But this is one of these things where you really can't be. You just grab it and throw it in. You start this at least a week ahead of when you need this solution. At least a week. Okay. What I do is, is I go get straws. I get orange ones. Why? Because my cap is orange. Okay? You go down and, I told you I'm OCD. You go down and you get these plastic straws. You go get them. I got these from Bed Bath & Beyond. But I'm going to tell you, I was in there because my wife was in there. I did not go in there on my own. Manly man. Yes, I did. I went and got these straws. Uh, you go in and get these plastic straws. Now, why? You stick them in here like this, okay? Yep, good stuff, tastes like steel. Okay, and then the next step is you go get yourself some vinegar. Get the kind that says cleaning vinegar. You know why? It's a, what's cheaper, yeah. Guys from Missouri. Okay, what the deal is, is a cleaning with a vinegar has a higher percentage of acetic acid. It's stronger, okay? Now, I, for, I forgot to tell you one thing, though. Before you put the, the stainless steel or the steel in, get yourself some simple green. Go put it in the sink and wash all the oil off of the steel wool. Did you know it has oil on it? So, some people don't know that, but I take all the steel wool whenever I work on a turning, and it's been washed. I don't want oil on my turnings. But anyway, so stick it in, stick it in a little bucket or something. Put some simple green. It's a good, it's a, a degreaser and you put it on there and it gets the oil off, okay? Now then, back up and you stick it in there. You put your yellow, your orange straws in there from Bed Bath & Beyond, and you take your, your vinegar, and I'm not gonna do it because it stinks like crazy, and you pour it in until it's about three times the height of your, of your stainless, of your steel, I keep saying stainless steel, your steel wool, about here. See where that little rusty spot is? You pour it in, put the cap on it. Now you see why I put the straws in? Now this doesn't float up. If it floats up, it rides on the top, and it will, and it will rust. When it rusts and you put it on wood, this is what you get. Okay? That's what you get. When you do it right, this next rack is what you get. You're going to get anywhere between a charcoal grayish color on maple to a dark, dark black on, uh, uh, that's my cleaning solution, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> Nafa, it's good stuff. And uh, uh, all the way up to a black on, on, but if you let that ride to the top and you get a high degree of that rust in it, it's never going to turn it black, okay? It's going to turn it rusty color, okay? So now once we get this, it sets for a week. It's going to stink. That's why you got the hose. It lets the gas out. You don't want to ever forget the hose. This will blow. It will blow up. Uh, I'll tell you the story about my grandfather doing a root beer in the basement sometime. Great story. Okay, it gets gas in it. Okay, so what we do is we end up with this stuff. It's called iron acetate. It looks kind of rusty. Once you get this out, 
You can run it through some coffee filters if you want to, it helps. But it still has a pretty high iron content in there, sometimes some small particles. Okay, what you do is pretty straightforward. You take the one that says iron acetate, get yourself a cheap brush, one of the little bristle brushes down. Cheap brush because it's going to get ruined. Doesn't matter what kind of brush it is. Okay, you mix that up and you put that across there and nothing. And you go, what in the world happened? Nothing. It don't work. Lay it down. Trust me, it's going to work. And on oak, and you just brush it on there like that. On walnut, walnut's a little faster. On cherry, I did some cherry, let's do some uh, maple. Okay, now it doesn't take long to see that the cherry is already turning and the walnut's already turning. The oak is starting to turn and the maple just looks pathetic. What's the difference? Tannin! What is tannin? Whoever said that? It's a vegetable protein, actually. And what it is, it's in certain vegetables. It's also in your skin. If you get that on you, well, I just did. It'll, get, it'll make you black. Okay? So, one of the things you can do is you can make the iron acetate, and it will work pretty good with, with, with this because Walnut has got high tannin content. Cherry has high tannin content. Oak, so-so. Mm, Depends on the kind of oak, and I'm going to show you here in a minute. Actually, the one going around, you're going to see that Ernie's got in his hands. One side is charcoal colored, and the other side is black. Look at the back of that board, and you'll see why, okay? I'm not going to tell you. Look at, look at the board. <laughs> Those of you who saw it, I'm going to tell you anyway. One of them's red oak, and one of them's white oak and red oak has a higher content of tannin. Okay, sometimes this works with your iron acetate mixture. This one's working pretty good. That's cool. That's just fine. Okay, sometimes it doesn't. And it doesn't matter, you can mix it up the same way. Temperature, all sorts of things, I swear. At the time of the month, I don't know, it changes. I've done this hundreds of times, seems like it. It's always different. So you have to kind of learn to adjust. One of the best ways to adjust is to add tannin to the mix. Let me put this in here and get some on my hands. Because I don't want to dump it on you. I hate kicking off a mine. It'll hunt you down. Okay. Take about 10 or 12 bags, 10 or 12 bags of tea. Put them in a half, in a pint or just a little of a quart. Bring it to a boil in the microwave and you get this very strong tea. What is one of the contents of tea? Tannin. tannin. Now you can take it and augment the tannin. Do you see what happened? Okay. Ooh, everybody said, ooh. Okay, I'm trying to keep it all in my hands. That's why I should have had the, the, uh, my gloves on. Okay, here's the cherry. I'm going to do it up here so we can. What you're getting is a chemical reaction. That's just tea. See it? Can you all see it? Say, so, yeah, I'll see it. Will that be more tea Why don't you come over here and let me put a little bit on your hand. See if you got how much... How much tannin you got in your body? Okay. Yeah. Actually, tannin is used to tan hides. That's why they used to, my people, the American Indians, used to uh, use vegetables of different kinds to rub it on leather to help tan it. Okay, sir. No, 
it doesn't seem to make a bit of difference either way. I've tried both. I do it that way, it's easier. And it's a bigger effect and people go, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> now, I got, I'm going to answer your question, but I've got to stop or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be remiss here. This is very important. You've got to listen to me on this one. It's wet. It's turning dark. This one isn't dark enough yet. I'm sorry. You've got to stop and you've got to wipe it off. If you don't, what will happen, what do you think will happen? Where's the rusty one? It'll rust, and, it'll, and it, we're talking minutes, okay? So when you do this, you've got to do it in stages. If you're really wanting something dark, first of all, there's two ways to do it. You're going to have to augment it and add tan, and I'm going to tell you about a different way in just a second but you've got to do it in stages. If you leave that on there, if you don't blot it off, it will rust, and I'm talking about within minutes, especially on a hot day. Sir? Have you tried any other acid? Yes, I'm going to tell you about it in a second. Okay? What about sanding that, Lev? You, you want to sand it to 220, and then you want to put water on it, and you want to sand it again. You want to raise the grain. Before all this coloring? Yes. Oh, before? Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, it helps. It helps. Okay. Okay. Now, walnut does real good. Okay. Cherry will do mm, okay, and the oak will eventually, if you keep doing this, will turn pretty good. Now, what? Oh, you already got it going around. What you saw the one with the uh, maple? It turns. It looks like driftwood. That is cool, because I made a real nice table for my daughter, and I used this method, and I put that on there, and it looks like it's old. It looks, it looks very old. So it's really cool for maples, okay? But you got to test your wood first, and you got to check it out. Now, the question, if you want this to go faster, there's another way to do it. You buy this stuff called Quebraco, Q-U-E-B-R-A-C-O, Quebraco. It comes from a taxidermy shop. They're online. I'm going to tell you two major uses for Quibraco. One is to raise tan, and the other is an aphrodisiac. So, don't want to catch it. A, it is an evergreen tree from Argentina. I am not. I am not bringing this. <laughs> was is in in the in South America. They discovered this evergreen tree, and the bark had this huge amounts of tannin. I don't know who discovered it, but it gets shipped into America in bags. It's 14 to 18 dollars a pound. Okay, if you put it on like I do the tea, it will turn uh, uh, the, the walnut dark black, but it'll also work well on the on the oak and the and the maple and stuff. But it's pricey, and I mean it is pricey. A lot of times you have to buy 20 pounds at a time. Okay, that's why I didn't buy it. Taxidermy shops sell it. And what do they sell it for? To tan leather. That's the primary reason. But like I said, there's the other use for what it's worth. Okay? That's the first method. I shouldn't, I should pass those around. Here's the second one. This is leather dye. Black leather dye. It's cheap. It come, this one came from Walmart. This Kiwi is two bucks. Down on Glenstone, 1400 block, I think, there's a Springfield leather. I have not checked with them, but I'm sure that the leather dye that they have would be a higher quality than this. But I wanted to, I wanted to go with as cheap as I could to show you, you know, how it works, okay? It goes pretty quick. Okay, again, you're going to raise the grain of 220. Don't go any higher than that. You're going to burnish it. You're going to make it non-porous and the stuff isn't going to go in. You start getting up 300, 400, 500, well, you're, you're going to burnish it. It's not going to go. Okay, but anyway, you pop the top off. Get yourself a piece of cherry. You squish it a little bit like this. Makes this little foamy stuff. And then you just kind of even it out. I'm passing some around so you're going to see uh, what it looks like. 
it seems to have trouble getting into woods that are not very porous, like maple. Okay? It seems to work really good, again, on walnut, and it works pretty good on, on the oak. For a quickie, something you want to do fast if you don't need dead, cold, black, this will work. It'll work okay. And it's fast. Again, the walnut always seems to shine. Hmm. Yeah, it will. It will. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go through a list of kind of drawbacks and stuff in a minute, and I'll talk a little bit about that. It does pretty good. Okay. Now the next one. We're going pretty fast because it's time. It's India ink. It's not just plain India ink. It's either Speedball, which is a brand, or a, uh, there's a, play, uh, a company called Dick Blick. That's a, he's an artist. Why those two? This is archival grade. It doesn't deteriorate. It's waterproof. It is permanent. It's free flowing. It doesn't. Um, it's it's a black pigment. It is cold dead black. It's what I did this with. Okay. It's what I ended up doing the chair with. A bottle of this is about twelve thirteen dollars. There's an art store down at I think it's at National and Walnut. National Walnut. I bought it there. Okay. Don't buy anything other than those two brands. Speedball or Dick Blick. Okay, trust me. Why? This is light fast and the UV doesn't affect it. Why? They want to be able to do calligraphy and stuff and then hang it up on the wall and it doesn't fade, and that's what this is for. Now, this is fairly difficult. It takes a lot of time to prepare it. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> what? Randolph's rolling his eyes. Now, you can just pour it on there. I wouldn't recommend it. I'd really recommend squirting a little bit in a little thing like that. It's easy to put away. Okay, and this has two major two components that are really good for your finishing. One is the pigment itself, the India ink. It also has shellac in it. It's kind of good. Why is it good? Because it helps it dry real quick. It also keeps this pigment out of the finish. You were asking about, does it mix with the finish there? Slide up. You were headed with that anyway. The first two will. It'll mix with the finish. I don't like it. This won't. Okay? When you, if you have a brush with the India ink and you use alcohol, this isopropyl alcohol that you get at the drugstore, okay? You can clean your brushes and it won't ruin the brushes. The rest of this will ruin the brush. It doesn't matter what kind it is. So you might as well just give that sucker up. Okay? It's not a technical term, that sucker, is it? Okay. And it's easy, 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 easy to put on. And it goes an incredibly long ways. That bottle I have had, I've done a chair, I've done... Oh, much stuff, okay? The magic. Yeah. It's cold, dead, black. It can be. Like an airbrush? Yeah. I don't have any trouble putting it on. You can, like, you can use it with a foam brush, or you can uh, uh, just put it on with a little bristle brush. And it, it's, it's very, 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 very uh, easy to put on. It looks really good on whatever you put on. Now, I will tell you, I happen to have a friend in the business of, of uh, refinishing pianos. And I've talked to him. It's been a couple of years. This is the way they do it. It's the way they get the black on it. Okay? Now, I'm surprised somebody hasn't said since I, I did the presentation on aniline dyes to use aniline dyes. What? I'm glad you asked. You can't get an, a black aniline dye that black. You can get a powder. You can mix water or alcohol with it. 
But in order to get enough alcohol with it to get it to salute, to get it to be a liquid, it just almost won't work. You, you always get it too thin. So if I was going to use a liquid, I would go turn to the India ink. Uh, no, I wouldn't even think about it. It's a vegetable dye. It's no UV protection, non-porous mixes. No. And actually, if you use red dye, it's going to be green when you put it on there. Not that I've ever tried. <laughs> no, actually, a, a friend of mine wanted to try it once. We did. Uh, the red dye is going different odd colors. I got it all over me, didn't I? Uh, have some odd colors until the, the heat hits them and certain kinds of things. So sometimes you'll use a red dye and you'll get an awfully weird color. Now, the India ink, uh, you can wash it up with water. I just did it off my fingers. But to keep it, to keep your brushes and stuff clean, use alcohol. Okay? Now, I went through that real quick. Questions? Real quick. I'm going to tell you some of the pros and cons and which one I would choose. But After you brush, after you brush it on, do you wipe it off? No. You don't have to do anything. It'll soak right in. This is also deeper penetrating than the other two methods. And how do I know? Because I've cut these things in half to see. Now, not by much, but what I find is, is if I put them on something like that, I, I take them and spinning on the lathe, I work them with steel wool that's been cleaned in Simple Green, and I put a second coat on it, and it builds quite well, and you have a nice thick coat. And the next time, you won't cut through it, and you can go ahead and put, I put uh, uh, water locks, I put uh, the new uh, 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 wood turning finish, and I've used a polyurethane on it, and I don't have any trouble. Okay, there's another question, sir. Oh, I guess you could. You you could cut it through, and and I don't sand it. Any, I, I I use steel wool so that I it if if there is any any I call them burrs, but just a little grain raising. The the stainless I keep saying stainless. The steel wool will cut those burrs, whereas sanding will dig in, and so I don't do it. And um, uh, what I do is is once I do that with steel wool. Then I, t I take a moist rag, because it's dried, it's got shellac in it, and I wash it off. And, uh, and I don't use your wash balls. <laughs> okay. And, and the thing is, is that then it's nice and clean and accepts the finish real well. Now, somebody asked me a question before we start, and I really want to talk about it. If you have, uh, let's say, for instance, a commonly, I'll do a top and or maybe a ring at the bottom or a top, it'll even be segmented. But I just want a little outer part, top to be black. Okay. When I turn the piece, I have a tool, I call it a diamond tool, but it's basically a, a flat tool. It's got a sharp point with a, a two a, a bevels on both sides. And I just put a little furrow in it. Okay. About an eighth of an inch deep. And that way, whenever I put the India ink, it runs into the furrow and it stops. And it won't go any further. Okay. That way I don't have to mask it off or anything. I can do it slowly, but if you'll do that, and it'll just kind of run in there. I learned that from Doug Fisher. Remember Doug? Our wood burning will do the same thing, just it's off a little bit. That's why I just went and do it right then. But yeah, you could. Uh, I did a, that, that big Christmas urn thing I did last year. I burned the, I burned the piece of the uh, uh, wise men, then I put the dye on it, and it ran right in those furrows and stopped. Okay, so you remember that. That'll keep you from bleeding into the other one. Okay? Now, let's talk about each one of these. Because the fifth part of my decision-making matrix is once you have some solutions and you test to pick one, what's wrong with this vinegar system? I couldn't think of a, one thing that was pro, one thing that was good about it. Not a thing. You can argue with me, but I can't think of one. It's not cheap, because by the time you get this stuff, and a week, it ain't cheap. And it needs a bunch of ingredients, steps, inconclusive results. I've had all sorts of stuff. It takes a week to prepare. It stinks. It doesn't work well on tannin wood. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. When you get the oak, sometimes it'll work good on one side, sometimes it won't. Okay? It's thin. Needs lots and lots of water, and I don't want lots and lots of water on my turning. 
Now you notice I didn't have to put a bunch of tannin and stuff on this, I just put it on, it's done. Okay, it's alcohol based and shellac, it's not going to do the damage that this is to your, to your wood turning, okay? So I don't use it. I know how to do it, and I know there are some people that do it. If you do a search on Google on ebonizing, if you got 200 hit, uh, uh, results, you'll get a lot more than that. 197 of them are this. And if you ask, most people never tried it. Okay? They just don't. It's, it's a, like an urban legend. Everybody says this is how you do it. It's cheaper, and it's not. I've tested it. It costs more. I'm going to tell you everything I can to keep you from doing this, except for one thing. If you're making something out of maple, and you see how it turned, and you want it to look like driftwood, it is a cool thing to do. That's the only reason I use it. The second reason I would use it, I would use the, the, the uh, vinegar, is if I have rust on my tool. Boy, you can drop it in this stuff and it cleans the rust right off. Just a little side thing. <clears throat> the pros of leather dye are, uh, I'm sorry. How long will the solution stay viable? I've heard people say months. I've heard people say longer. Not very long. In the summertime, a couple of weeks, because of the heat, it'll rust. This time of the year, if you had it setting out, probably longer. But it's, it's inconsistent, and it's one of the reasons I hate it. I don't like it. Uh, this, this is four years old. I'm sorry, sir. And it may continue to keep on going. Yeah. And, and, and also, the, uh, the brand of, of uh, vinegar seems to make a big difference. Okay, leather dye. Leather dye is pretty cool. It goes on, it's cheap, it's easy to get, okay, it's ready to use, it's easy to apply, and so forth, and you can touch up your shoes, I guess, if you want to. But here's the thing that you really got to think about. It's not light fast. That means it will fade. It doesn't have anything in there to stop UV. It's non-archival, which means it'll break down. It has a limited shelf life just setting. If you set this down after a while, it, it separates and it goes kind of weird, a while being about a year or so, okay? And I always think it looks charcoal gray. See? Now, that's one coat. I could put another coat on and make it a little darker. It's still going to look charcoal -y. If you want a charcoal color and it's going to be a piece on the inside, that might be the ticket, okay? But just remember, it could break down on you. Okay. Now the India ink is what I use. It's what I would recommend you use. Why? It's one piece. All you need is this, a brush, a little bit of water, and a little later on, if you take your brush out, it may get a little sticky. You need some alcohol in it to get that shellac out. No big deal. Or just use the alcohol. You can put multiple coats on and wipe it off with uh, steel wool. It dries quick. This is already drying, okay? Now, I'll probably get a little bit of residue off that a little bit. But when it dries, you won't, okay? It won't mix with the finish, okay? And then the best, I, I like it because I can rub it with steel wool, okay? And it cuts very good. Questions? Do you have any questions? Sir? Is steel wool finer or better? I use zero, zero, zero steel wool. The question was what steel wool to use. I use the really fine stuff. It's, it's this zero, zero, zero stuff. Okay? And I cut it in pieces, and, and I spin it real fast, and I cut the burrs off, anything that raised. It doesn't raise the grain much, but and then you just gently do it, and then I put a second coat on. Okay? And the second coat then uh, is what I finish. And I might gently, real gently with stainless steel. You don't want to push it hard. You just... Knocking those nubs off. Ernie, do you have a question? Sir. Yes. It tries to, especially if you, I've done it, I've used it on the oak, and it seems to try to stop, uh, to seal the pores. It, it, it makes a smoother finish. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. He, Ernie was asking if it, if it seals the pores or it seals things, and I think that's, yes, it does. It's made for porous stuff. It's made for paper primarily. And I think that's why they use the shellac, but it, but it does seem to seal. 
And I think that's why it allows you to build better. I don't know. I would probably go back with, with a, a better leather die. Okay? I would try that. Um, I would experiment with that and see. And you, I, like I said, I wouldn't use the cheap stuff like I got. I got it just to show, make a point. I think what I would do is I would hit one of the leather, like Springfield leather, and I would try to see if I could get a higher quality leather die because the higher quality stuff is alcohol based and I don't know if it has shellac in it or not. I don't think so. I wouldn't because it has soap in it and it's, they're usually way, way too tough. They're, I don't know, I've never used them, so I would, I would experiment and say. But this really doesn't seem to raise the grain, not the India ink. Uh, I, I, this does, boy, without a doubt, it'll pop it right up. But usually this doesn't seem to raise it up. So, sir? What's the final drip on your sample? 220. I never go past 220 on anything. Any more than that, you're burnishing. It's either, uh, glad you asked that. The bottom part of this, Larry, if you want to hold that up, I'm going to. The bottom one is done with water locks. The top, the finial part, is done with uh, the new uh, general finishes, water based wood turning finish. And I, I, I like them both. Okay. You see it now? There we go. Okay. And. Uh, I've used both, but I, I don't think it's going to matter much. I think you can use just about anything you want it. Uh, I wouldn't hesitate to use polyurethane, and that's about the only three I use is polyurethane, water locks, and then this new stuff, the water-based stuff. Okay? But it is cold, dead black. If you want something other than that, you're going to have to come up with a different formula. Ma'am? Have I ever soaked wood in it? Yes, I have. Yeah, I have no life. I do stuff like that. Uh, and actually, that's what I, I, I've done with these, is I've, I've soaked them just to see what would happen. I cut the end grain off because I figure the pores in the end grain don't count, okay? And then I want to see what it goes in the surface, and this is a better penetrator. I have no idea why, you know? I would think something along the lines of the water would, but it doesn't. This penetrates quite well. Now, we're still only talking about a tenth of a millimeter, probably, but, but this will go in almost twice as much. Sir? Have you turned any lacquer on top of the lacquer? That would be one of the things that would probably work quite well, especially if you, I think what it's going to do is the lacquer is going to soak right in, and it's going to soak it up a little bit, but I think it's going to be okay, but I haven't tried it. But my guess is it's going to work quite well because, again, like I said, I had this friend, and that's what they use as lacquers on the pianos. And, and I suspect it's going to be quite good. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Sir? Yeah, and I think that's probably one of the, maybe one of the primary reasons they put it in. I just speculate. Because one of those that shellac sticks to everything. I suspect that's why they put the shellac in this, because uh, they advertise this stuff to go on virtually anything. They do this for glass painting and stuff like that. So, Any more? Anything else? I went over my time way over. Sorry, Larry. Yeah. You okay? Yeah.